and welcome to this, another episode of Frame and Reference. I'm your host, Kenny McMillan, and today we're talking with Wes Cardino and Maria Garcia, the DP and director slash costume designer, respectively, of uh, a couple music videos from Galma Set. I say a couple because one of them is French and I can't really pronounce it, but it's in the title of the, <laughs> of the, of the uh, episode here, as well as a music video called Julia, which is much easier to pronounce. Um, this is a, a lovely, um, warm, creative conversation that I think you're going to love. Uh, Wes has a very, um, I'm at a loss for words, but like educated uh, <laughs> uh, cinematography language that he employs a lot, even in his commercial work. Um, you know, Maria is, is an accomplished costume designer. We talk about that, but also, you know, obviously a director and, and the two of them do a lot of great work. So um, really enjoyed this conversation and I think you will too. So uh, without any adieus to be furthered, here's my conversation with Wes and Maria. As, as you heard, Wes, uh, the way that we tend to start is um, by asking what got you hooked in cinemas. Um, not necessarily like how'd you get to where you are in your career, but like what, um, you know, I, I imagine with costuming, it wasn't, was it film at first that started with costuming or was it, was it more like um, you just enjoyed fashion or something? Um, I think what got me hooked was sort of my interest in opera. From a young age, my grandmother is named after Gilda from Rigoletto, and she was always take, singing opera, and then she eventually started taking me to the opera. But yeah, my background, short versions, my background's in, in theater and, and live art and opera and dance. So that's sort of my entry point. Um, and then, you know, s- slowly I've been arriving at doing sort of film from a sort of like short form. Uh, gotcha. Yeah. Was that, was it always, uh, coming from theater is so fun because there's a lot of, I can't say a lot of DPs have come from theater, but obviously like production design, uh, costume actors, of course. Um, did you find that that, that it's kind of a different environment working on a, on a set versus maybe if you've worked in, in theater before? For sure. I think just like, cause for this music video that we're talking about, I directed it as well, but just like from a costume standpoint, I was thinking about this earlier today, but it's like, whether you're the costume designer or you're dressing like someone about to go on stage, you're kind of like, you do your best, you get them dressed and <laughs> away they go. And it's sort of like, I'll see you on the other side. But right. I feel, and of course, that I, there's that on film sets as well. But I, I think that there's a bit, you know, there's refining and things that you can continue to do while you're while you're shooting, um, which is a bit different from the live elements of being on a stage. Yeah. You know, there's uh, something unique that I, I occurred to me while watching the but actually both the music videos you guys did. But um, in cinematography, you either rent the stuff or you own the stuff. And I've noticed like all the production designers and all the costume designers will go to whatever store and buy the stuff and really keep it pristine and keep the receipts. Um, <laughs> do you, do you have, is there, is there a like customer analogy to the kind of um, renting out your own stuff? Do you end up owning anything you've ever kind of used or is it all kind of in that realm? Do I end up own? I think um, I kind of come from like a devised theater background, carnival arts, and there's lots of, I've had to be scrappy and make things myself a lot of the time. And for these, both of these projects, you know, what I wanted didn't exist. So I made it myself. And then I, oh, cool. after each project, I, I usually keep everything and sort of catalog it in a box and try and reuse it if I can. Gotcha. Very what got, Yeah. What, uh, did you go to college for like making stuff like that? Or was that, was that all, um, just kind of, uh, what do you call it? Hobby based. Um, I, so I studied at FIDM, I did a degree in fashion and then I did a theater studies degree in London. Um, and it was sort of when I was in London, uh, they gave me like, they let me use a workshop there and I got to use like the set building workshop. So I'd make these like weirdo costumes out of, I don't know, wood and random things there. So I kind of just learned how to make things myself and then also just being thrown into it so for like running wardrobe jobs i started dressing um i would study and then in the evening i would go work at opera houses as a dresser and just pick things up along the way and then i think when you have to work on a project you're just forced to or i was just forced to learn how to make 
to make things because I couldn't necessarily always find uh, or afford to rent what I wanted. <laughs> right. I'm I'm sorry. I'm just interrogating you right off the bat because I know far <laughs> less about uh, uh, costuming than than cinematography. But um, how does how does one just do you just is it like an application process to go to an opera house and be like, hey, let me hang out and stuff, or or do you kind of have to know the lingo as it were? Um, for me, I uh, I started dressing at fashion shows like when I was in high school, um, so. I, there was a summer job I applied for at Gwynebourne Opera House um, in the UK, this beautiful, magical place. And um, the running wardrobe manager there hired me. I was very lucky. And she was sort of because of the experience of dressing at fashion shows. But she put me I had no experience working in opera houses. And she put me in as like the dresser for the <laughs> all the lead singers. Nice. So I was just thrown in there and it would be like, I remember the first one I worked on was Eugene Onegan and it was just like, there was five quick changes and like you, I had to like change someone's complete costume in like 20 seconds. And like, <laughs> it's, it's so, I think that was, that job was so fun because it's like an adrenaline rush. But um, yeah, I kind of just, I was able to get that one job and then sort of, it helped me get other jobs working at opera houses. And then I sort of started to meet artists where I could, you know, start designing stuff myself as well. Totally. That, so I, uh, I was a theater kid growing up, but I was also uh, heavily into magic and I'm actually getting back into it. But when you say like changing someone out, do you utilize elements of like quick change performances or is it just like get ripped, cl ripping clothing off of uh, actors? <laughs> <laughs> It's very, you have to be very precise because it's like I said, like if I'm taking a gown off of someone, I have to change their tights and their shoes. And like, don't forget, I forgot the ring one time and it was like a catastrophe that I forgot to put the <laughs> ring on because um, it's really important to this story. But yeah, there's like certain ways you set, you go before your change, like maybe 20 minutes and you there's a quick change booth on the side of stage. And you set up everything so the tights will be laid out so they can just put their feet right in it, the shoes right next to it. You there's a ta there's like a sheet on the ground and then the gown goes on top of it so that someone can you take their clothes off and then they jump into the you sort of just leap into the clothes. Yeah. Sure. And they're made they're made for a lot of these costumes for opera made if there's a quick change, then they'll be like poppers or snaps or something that can easily work. Right. Yeah, because that, that's what I was kind of wondering is like how, how much design goes into the costumes when you know there has to be a quick turnaround or do you like end up learning like, oh, I built this nice costume and then now I realize I have to get this person out of it in seconds. <laughs> I'm sure that happens sometimes, but that'll usually be probably be a mistake if it wasn't considered from the sort of original design phase. Sure. Uh, now. Wes, going over to you, like, what were you always a film guy or or did you come to it later in life? I've met like half of the people I've interviewed started as architects for some reason. I have no idea <laughs> what yeah. it was about architecture. Um, right. Well, uh, I mean, I guess I was I, I, I didn't really, you know, like when I was growing up, I didn't have like cameras around the house and video cameras and all that kind of stuff. So <laughs> strangely, you know, my the beginnings were like, you know, me making up sort of stories in my head. And I always found that I was doing that, uh, with a, with the sort of idea of a frame and a composition and a dramatic lighting. And I think that started when I was really, really young. I, I grew up in, uh, Western New York and I, the, there was a, uh, uh, art museum there, the Albright Knox, um, and so I went there when I was really young and there's a, there's actually a lot of like amazing paintings there from, you know, and artwork and sculpture and stuff from a lot of really famous world renowned artists from the past. So I got to see all that stuff as a kid. And, um, there's like a, there was like a replica, a bronze replica of the Michelangelo's David. Mm -hmm out front i don't know if they moved it but i haven't been there in a long time but anyway um so i like saw that i became obsessed with 
Renaissance art and Michelangelo in specific, you know, in particular. So, uh, you know, that's where it started for me, I think. And then, um, you know, I was like a kid of the 80s and 90s. So I was watching like music videos all the time. Um, and then strangely, I don't know even how this happened, why this would have happened. But <laughs> when the movie The Last Emperor came out, the Bertolucci film. Yeah. Yeah. Um, shot by Storaro. I think that was like maybe in the late eighties or something or middle eighties. Um, I saw that movie in the theaters. I don't know if my mom wanted to see it or, you know, and I ended up going and at the time, like, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to say that I understood the complexities of that film, but I distinctly remember how impactful the images were to me and the, how those images and the lighting and the, and all of that conveyed the emotion. And I just got lost in that. And so I think, you know, that was like a big pivotal moment. And I kind of was like, what is that? Like, what is that thing that who, who makes all these images? And, and that's, and that's when I started getting into it. So then from there, you know, of course I became a, you know, I, I wanted to see every movie that Storaro had shot and that opened up doors to other things. And, you know, cause I was like maybe nine or something or 10 or something at that time. So, and then, and then I, and that's when I sort of became like, you know, Oh, it's movies, it's music videos, it's stuff like that. But I never lost my interest in art. You know, I, 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 you know, that was still, you know, doodling and painting and stuff like that. Um, but I just, but, but, it, but yeah, movies then at that point in my life became the sort of predominant um, driving factor, I guess. You know, it's, it's fascinating you say that because I was watching, like I said, both music videos and I was like, there's this, obviously with the, the black and white one, the name I can't pronounce because I don't speak French. Um, <laughs> the, the, uh, it does have a, a very like French new wave slash like, um, oh shit. What's the, the movie, the chess movie, the oldest movie on the planet. Um, black and white. He plays chess against the devil. Why am I blanking on this? Oh, oh yeah. Um, uh, the seven seal. Yeah. Seven seal. There you go. Yeah. Uh, it, ha it has actually we watched re <laughs> recently. We were watching, <laughs> um, yeah, it has like it has that weird like yeah, not weird, but uh, an interesting combination of um yeah, French New Wave, Seventh Seal kind of vibe and also just random pockets of modernity that felt very kind of like 90s, 80s music videos. So that's I can absolutely see that uh through line through there. That's very cool. Yeah. Um actually speaking of that cuz there's a lot of really amazing, especially in the 90s uh uh impactful but also very kind of i would say like important directors and cinematographers that came up through music videos were there any that kind of stood out to you as being particularly um informative to your style or things that really kind of stood out to you you mean like a sort of 90s cinematographers that i yeah, yeah at the or, time. or directors because that was a very like you know the the classic ones I always say are like the the you know that director's box set the the Mark Romanek um, Spike Spike Jones uh, yeah, Chris, Chris Cunningham. Cunningham yeah 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 I mean I've def I definitely I uh, definitely I don't own that box set but I definitely watched many of the videos from that and of course I I think that that I always I still think to this day that the the music video that uh, Chris Cunningham did for uh, Bjork for for her for that single all is full of love was like so incredible such an incredible music video um i was like fascinated with that one the first time i saw it um but i you know i also saw like tons of like like 80s videos you know like yeah. jackson and like david lee roth and stuff all those like crazy like david lee roth <laughs> videos from like the 80s and like van halen and stuff um but no i mean i i think like a big standout, like a lot of the stuff that Harris Savides, I think, did in the 90s, early 90s um, music videos. I mean, that was definitely a big influence. I mean, it, it's hard to know. Like, I sort of look back and I I try to think like, you know, Mark Romantic stuff. I think, you know, I mean, I, I look back and I think, oh, who shot that? Because at the time, like I never... I never really followed up on it. You couldn't really right. find that information out, right? Like, right. like who shot it? Like, um, so... So yeah, I, I, I it wasn't it wasn't until later that I like went back, but I would definitely say like 
Savides, Dan- Daniel Pearl. I mean, his work is so, I mean, he's also done a ton of commercials, but his work was, was amazing, um, is amazing. Um, so I would say those are two big influences. And then, but I think my bigger influences come from, specifically from the film world, come from, I think, movies from the 70s and, and, and the 80s. That, 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 I think, played a bigger role or formative role. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Cause the, um, it, it's not oftentimes I've noticed that, uh, younger filmmakers will, you know, the fun parts of film, certainly I, this happened to me, um, the fun films, you know, your men in black or whatever gets you into movies. And then you have to go back and realize like, even for a, a quote unquote, you know, comedy or whatever, um, there's still, uh, that work is still informed by the older masters, you know? And so it's, it's cool to, to hear that you got that start there. Cause like I said, you can totally see it in your work. Like there is definitely a, um, uh, maturity to the work that both, you know, in the music videos, uh, what am I trying to say? Like it, you, it, you can tell that you're informed by, by whatever paintings or stuff like that. It's very, um, cool. Oh, it's cool to see. Yeah, no, thank you for saying that. I, I mean, I hope it comes through, but <laughs> that's the dream, right? Like, like, oh, I hope all that stuff that I love so much comes through, <laughs> the good stuff. But um, yeah, well, no, I mean, I mean, also, I was just going to add quickly, like, of course, I love all the like, you know, old blockbusters too. Like, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I've Back to the Future and like the Spielbergs. I mean, like, for sure, like huge, hugely influential, you know, Um because also like a lot of the great, you know, Dean Cundy and like Alan Davi, I mean, like they were all shooting those movies. I mean, it's just like, you know, not just, not just like, like the high art stuff from the sixties and, and early seventies from Europe or something, you know, I mean, I, so yeah, I mean that, that stuff hugely influential as well, you know, you know, it's funny you mentioned back to the future. Cause I pulled a bunch of, do you have shot deck? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I uh, pulled a bunch of stills. It's the it's the best. Uh I pulled a bunch of stills from Back to the Future to use as an example in an article I've yet to write. Um but where people say like, "Oh, the film look. Oh, I, I need to, I need it to look like film." And I've noticed some of your work is like really specifically like photochemical film uh either you were shooting film or you 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 know found a way to color it as such, but uh, replicate it but um back to the future is like not lit very well like it does, you know it's pretty like especially in like 4k you're looking at it and you're like honestly like this one of the best movies ever made everyone's favorite that doesn't look amazing like, yeah it's kind of like yeah it's kind of flat it's kind of like super bright high key hard. Yeah, for sure. yeah hard light super hard light you know um but uh, yeah, definitely. But, you know, I think that, you know, it speaks to something because I think about this a lot. I I think a lot of um, cinematographers get lost in technical stuff. And, totally. you know, strangely, a movie like that, this massive blockbuster hit from the 80s, you know, it's a story, right? Like that's that's what brings you there and and of course, like if, if you're a cinematographer, you look at it and you're like, well, you know, it's not like the most glamorous looking or most graphic looking film ever shot. I mean, I do think it's like really well shot still, but it doesn't, you're right. You know, like it doesn't, it doesn't have that like vibe that, that dr- super kind of dramatic vibe, I guess. But, um, uh, but I, but you know, it's just like the story is like so compelling and at the time, I guess, you know, maybe there's some like old film from the 40s or 50s, some monster movie or something that that they drew a lot of inspiration from. I don't know. But, um, you know, it's it, at the time it was like, oh, he's never seen anything like that for like what a compelling, amazing story. And like you could probably have shot that on like Super 8 and people would have been like, that's a that was awesome. That was so cool. Yeah. Um, great characters. I mean, it's just um so I think that's a big, big part of it, you know? Well, the other thing too is, uh, I, so I'm a drummer and I, and I'm actually next week, I'm going to interview, um, some people and, and one of their two DPs. And, uh, one of their quotes was that like a good DP is like a drummer, like they need to keep the beat, make sure the song's going good. But if they're ever slow or fast or like too exuberant or whatever, everyone notices and it doesn't help. So yeah. like, you know, back to the future doesn't need, 
Back to the Future is exactly what it needs to be for that story to work. Anything more, and it probably would have been a little like, oh, are they trying too hard or something like that? Yeah, for sure. I do think that, that there's some truth to that. I mean, I, I it's sort of like the, the, the best and worst comment you can get is like, oh, that movie looked so amazing. Right. And that's all that they say. That's all that someone says. And that doesn't mean that like you failed as a cinematographer. I mean, you've obviously succeeded because you were able to make a beautiful film. Maybe the script was bad. I mean, who knows? But um but you know, it's it's you want people you want the audience to respond to the story through the images. Yeah. Not be responding to the images on their own, I think, you know, I think that for me, that's important. I mean, maybe in commercials and music videos, it's a little bit different, but, um, but even doing those, it's still informed by a story for me. Yeah. Maria, is there, I was gonna say, is there like a, a kind of a through line like that for you? Like, cause obviously you, you don't want to put some, uh, person in a film in some crazy costume if they're just like, your average Joe or whatever, but how, how do you walk that tightrope between making the costumes um, fit the character, but also maybe be interesting or, or even something more practical, like read well on camera. That's something I've noticed when I go to theaters and they have the like little displays with the costumes in them. They're always like real chunky, like even suits are incredibly textury. Mm hmm. How the question? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, how sorry, you, I, I ramble. Um, <laughs> just, uh, how do you walk the line between uh, making the costume fit the character and fit the narrative, but also be, uh, I don't know what the the word would be, but like interesting is interesting is not the right or not interesting. I don't know how, what what what's your thought process when going into designing a costume for a certain character or story. Um, I think I research is really important and making sure that you're like grounded in this story and something that's always helped me is like not imposing anything onto it so like make sure it's in service of the story um and then the other thing that i've always found really helpful is just like how are you creating opportunities for the story but and for the people that are wearing the clothes and and looking for those opportunities i think it's really important um, but yeah, just going back to the story and, and honing in is is really important for costumes, I think. What do you uh, what do you mean by opportunities? Um, I guess so. If we're thinking about, I'm just going to give an example, like a dance sure. example, for example. So if someone's going to be twirling around or doing some crazy movement, and one time I put someone in a trench coat, but I wanted, but I. <laughs> myself i lined the trench coat in a specific fabric because i wanted it to play with the lights and also it was like you know, you're talking about magic it's kind of sort of like an opportunity there it's like a little magic trick or something where you're sort of creating other dimensions within the story if that makes mm, sense totally that's more of like a gimmicky example but you know just putting someone in a red dress for like why are there where I think everything needs you need to interrogate everything you do and and make sure you know why you're doing everything. I, I think um, it, that always helps. Yeah, the the two examples that immediately come to mind again. I don't know shit about costuming, but when the two were uh, um, uh, what's her name um, Julie Julie Andrews in uh, Mary Poppins. Apparently, like the inside of her dress was all red because she thought Mary Poppins was real saucy when she was off the clock it was like red silk on the inside of the dress and then the other one is apparently like tarantino will like make have the prop department make like receipts and like random stuff that he'll put like for where that uh character went that morning he'll like stuff those in the pocket so the actor like finds things that help inform the character um, oh wow that's amazing huh. so is that kind of i mean obviously those are like not the first one, but the Tarantino one's obviously an extreme example. But do, do you find that you, um, some, at, what aspect of costuming is informing the actor about what they're doing and how much of, are you listening to the actor to inform the costume? What's the interplay there? Um, I think just like how the clothes, like, how are they going to feel? How do they fit? Um, and then of course there's like a conversation with, the actor, performers, whoever's wearing the clothes. I like to like develop a 
conversation there to make sure that it works. Again, it's like you don't want to impose if something's just not working and they're telling you, then I think trying to work with them to find a middle ground is always helpful. I'm trying to think of for the music video for Je Vois if we, costume was really important for that music video in particular. Yeah. Um, but I think there's just like the masks, for example, the mask that the masks that she's wearing, I think those are like serving a purpose. And so I, I think everything that you put something in, why are you using this and what is it going to do? How's it going to help tell the story, aid the performer? Yeah. Yeah, the the costuming in that in that one you just said the French one. Uh, the <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm probably not saying it correctly. I, I, I looked at it. <laughs> say again. Je vois les ciels. Gal Mousset, the artist, would probably would probably be good. Yeah, she it, she'd have the me. proper uh, pronunciation. <laughs> I shorthanded it to je vois. Um, yeah, I'm gonna do that. <laughs> yeah, je vois. Okay. I, I looked at it and I, I went, uh, nope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, uh, that video, especially like, uh, cause I'm kind of a dummy. Um, and I also don't speak French. What, what was kind of the, uh, narrative and how, and how I want to get to the cinematography in a second, but specifically for you, what were, what were you trying to tell in that narrative of that video specifically? Cause it, cause again, it, I don't speak French. <laughs> So I, I didn't quite get the uh, the explicit uh, script there. Okay. Um, so this song is about, uh, it's sort of someone who's lonely. Every day is the same. They look up at the sky and it's about time passing and loneliness and longing. And so for the video, again, it, similarly, it follows a woman who's bored in her life. Every single day is the same. Um, She's staring out the window. She decides to go for a walk. And while she's on her walk, she sees this older couple who are very much in love from what she can tell. And she becomes transformed by her obsession. Not just that she's like these two people are in love, but she actually is obsessed with following them. And she sort of goes to great lengths to follow them and document their every move. And in that in doing that, she sort of transforms herself into this sort of, it becomes a like carnival uh, experience for her. And she transforms into this character, which we call the Venetian. I mean, that's the sort of character you see in the, the sort of medieval carnival mask. At the end. Yeah, it's a, I, I will say, I guess the two, the two, separate photos of the old couple i did kind of get the vibe from that one i was like okay yeah 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 <laughs> um and you did you say you directed it as well yes okay so was that was that story is that story inherent i assume it's inherent in the song or was how much like um uh extra were you putting into the what would you what am i trying to say like um Was there anything in, in the in the video that's not explicit in the text that you were kind of um, evo evoking and kind of pushing, having the video be um, an explan? Or God, this is a terrible question. No, it's not. It's, <laughs> Do you know where I'm going with that? Do you know what I'm trying to say? <laughs> yeah, the song is is very much about like what I just said. Someone who's like every day is the same, melancholy. Um, but we sort of developed the story inspired by the song but the story right. inspired by the song but it's something that we created for the music video gotcha now west the uh oh were you gonna say something no i was just gonna say that maria spent a lot of time sort of developing that story from listening to the song so but yeah oh the one thing that i'll add there is there's a french artist sophie calais um who in her early work, she was she picked up a camera and just started following people, like stalking people on the street and taking photos. And she'd go to great lengths to follow them. At one point, she, I think she followed a man to Venice. And that was sort of an uh, inspiration for the video as well. Interesting. I'll have to look that up. That's a, <laughs> that's a very interesting... Uh... Borderline art. illegal art project. Yeah, dark, <laughs> creepy obsessions. <laughs> um, 
I mean, it's the, you know, the Europeans, whatever. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, France to Venice is like what? 20 miles. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I wanted to, were there any kind of visual uh, touchstones or, or inspiration for the video? Cause like I said, it, it does have a very seventh seal kind of um, the, the black and white work is really beautiful and, and textural in a way that I think make Mank wishes it did. <laughs> um, but yeah, so kind of t- talk to me about how, like what maybe you were looking towards as, as touchstones for that look and how you sort of achieved that. Yeah. So um, I mean, I, I think all of that, old black and white photography was in my head while I, you know, while we were preparing and in pre-production, um, Maria came with the, the, you know, she came with her, her deck of, of like visual images and, and what was really refreshing is a lot of it was photography. Actually, all of it, I think was photography with a few film references. Um, and I was like, oh, and and some of those were the Sophie Calais photos, which I which I recall were in black and white. Um, I don't know why I was like thinking about um, these old uh, like Stieglitz photos and mm. Ed Stitchin photos. Um, he was an amazing photographer. Actually, he did a lot of early like stuff and and um, really sort of graphic and and. Um, so so that stuff was swirling around in there and and um yeah and i I, you know and when maria started to like tell me about the idea and and the carnival elements and the i you know i i was like oh there's like a playful element to this as well you know it's it's got a bit of a french new wave vibe you know a sort of fun looseness to it and i started you know and i was looking at some go early godard and and early um truffaut and of course, Agnes Varda, you know, it's just like such beautiful stuff that she, that she did in her career. Um, you know, and so we started throwing all these ideas around and all these like images and uh, that's kind of what, and then if, you know, and then I was like, Hey, we should let, let like, let's do this in black and white, like the textures. And, you know, that was another aspect, Marie, I think, or, uh, what, <laughs> what, what? Nothing. I just I, I Maria's like really into. I, I think came, I think I was just like I want it in black and white because there it needs to be like documentation, like private eye, someone's following, and like an envelope of photos of, you know, and then also nostalgia. But it's just so interesting hearing Wes because Wes comes at it from a different entry point of like a film <laughs> background, and we were wa- we were watching some of these films lately after we made the video and it came out, and I just I didn't have those references before. It was mm. just it was like a, just a different entry point, which I think is so interesting. Well, she had like yeah, but I you know so we just threw those things back and forth together, you know, because she, she she would come from with sort of like some fashion photography stuff, like some, I think she had like a couple of like Richard Avedon photos. And if you look at his work, I mean, it's some of his work, it's like really graphic and, and you can feel like the texture and the whites and the blacks. And so I I just, yeah, for me, it's just like grabbing all that stuff, letting it sink in, thinking about the story, what's important. And then it sort of organically comes back out as something new. It's like always going to be in a strange way, an homage, or you're going to be um, stealing from uh, all of your heroes. And um, uh, but, but, but it comes out a little bit different, you know, when you, when you do it. And that's kind of like, I guess what, for me, what, how it sort of all happened, hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, but but also I was just going to add that I think when Maria builds her costumes for instance um and when she thinks about her concept it's so I wrote this down it's like she has such an expansive imagination about those things and with the costumes like texture is is something that I think she pays a lot of attention to like what kind of fabric do I want to use and how will this affect the the performer's performance or, or is it, or whatever the expression of that character is, you know, I want, you know, text, it's not just about like 
the costume looking a certain way. It's, it's also about texture for her too, you know, through our conversations. So then when I let that, I try to listen to that and say, okay, well then the visuals have to integrate that as well. It's all gotta be sort of unified, you know, there has to be a unified element. And so, and I just thought as well, like the, the black and white is like Maria said, it's, it, it's the sort of documentarian element that the, 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 the private eye kind of element to it, but also it's a way to like, for me, it was like the graphic nature, the text, the graphic textures of the locations and the costumes and, and also just the element of playfulness, you know, that kind of French new wave kind of vibe as well. Yeah. The, uh, in that, in the music video, uh, Julia, I, I, one costume thing that I, I noticed, I don't know if you made two costumes or if that's just what water did, but when she's all wet, it looks like she's wearing rubber. Oh, she's wearing um, the dress is neoprene. It's like wetsuit. Okay. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. at first I thought it was like silk or something, and then it looked all rubbery, and I was like, wait a second, what have we done yeah. here? <laughs> well, that, but that was like a deliberate, that was interesting. Um, that's cool that you saw that. that. But that was like a deliberate thing that like we kind of spoke about and like sort of labored over like, oh, is this the right material for this dress? And like, how will it? render on camera when it's wet versus when it's dry. And like, we think about, you know, we, we thought West about this. It's very involved. And I think for Jevoil, for the medieval carnival Venetian character, I made Wes go to the fabric store with me <laughs> to pick the fabric out. Cause I wanted to make sure that it was going to be the best one for black Listen, and white. I love a Joanne's. I'm not going to, I would not kick my feet to go. <laughs> Well, you know, that's the, that's something. They're very crowded during the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Crafts. Lots of crafts going on during the Oh, pandemic. the Michaels by my house was a fucking nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Whenever I have to like, if I want to go get something like a, whatever it's, you know, glue bottle and I have to go to a Michaels to do it because it's a specialty. I'm like, oh my God. I'm... <laughs> yeah. Very long time. But um, yeah. So. The uh, one thing I wanted to ask about the the black and white photography specifically, and this will actually kick off into a different thing about film emulation in general. Emulation in general is: Are you coloring your own work? Because it seems like this whole operation is very hands on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I like to be hands on. Maria's super hands on with a lot of stuff. Um, but no, we this this uh, music video we. Uh, Matt Wallach at at um, Company Three uh, graded the the video, did a fantastic job. Um, you know, we shot it in color, knowing that we were going to shoot in black, knowing that we were going to finish in black and white. So that was why, like, we went, we did the the, the fabric shopping to, together. Marie asked me to do that because. Once we knew we wanted it to be black and white, I didn't approach it from a, let's just shoot in color and f fix all the all the the the, the um, grayscale and, and yeah, oh, like I I really we both approached it from a from a standpoint of this is black and white and how is this going to look on black if we were shooting black and white film how would this look without the ability to change all those things in post. So we, we that was the approach for us. And that was one of the reasons. So, um, and then of course, Matt did a fantastic job, like giving it nuance and tweaking all the things that we couldn't control, you know? Yeah. Was all the diffusion done in post or was that, did you, were you, what, what were you shooting? What was the, the camera package for that? Yeah. Yeah. We, we went with like a really small package. I, I used the, uh, uh black magic cinema camera on that the 4k version yeah which is great kind camera. Of soft. yeah it's it like i mean i look i mean it, it it's it has its drawbacks i mean it doesn't have the greatest dynamic range or whatever but i actually really like the camera like for what it for what it is what you can do with it how quickly you can move especially on on budgets and you know constraints for smaller budget things like music videos i, I love that camera i mean it's yeah. so and you can put it in interesting places. Um, so we use that. Uh, we used like a mixture of different types of glass, Zeiss and some old Nikon lenses. Um, so I think a lot of the 
softness of it is a combination of the camera and the uh the environments and also the the lenses for sure um because i didn't use any diffusion on that on that uh gotcha music. yeah we did a little bit of of halation emulation and post yeah but other than that no 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 you know in the, in front of the lens diffusion yeah the, the reason i was asking is because the reason i mentioned mank was that uh that soft black that uh i know they they worked really hard to get on mank was seen kind of here as well like that um didn't feel it didn't feel like a lens effect it felt more like a what would have been i suppose like orthographic film but in these days would be post uh, right i've seen a lot of, like have you because there was those little short i'm gonna guess it was for a clothing company where there, there's like a girl by a train um Oh yeah, that was a jewelry company actually. <laughs> jewelry company. Yeah. Um, were those shot on film or was that also that emulation done in post? No, that was all shot on uh, Super Eight. Yeah. Okay. Uh, director uh, Anton Anton Dupreez, um did those spots, and uh, we we the the client uh they liked that look and at first we we actually thought like oh maybe we should just shoot it on an alexa and we'll just do all the we'll do it in post and then we were like nah why why would we do that no fun in that yeah <laughs> so so yeah no we shot that on super eight actually that was because i was gonna say like if someone did do that in post they deserve a raise or some kind of award or something because it looked like film because it is um do you, do you have a preference? Do you, do you, uh, are you like kind of a, especially coming from your, uh, let's say more, uh, historically laden background, like, do you prefer film or, or do you find digital to be just fine? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's like such a, uh, I don't think it's such a contentious issue anymore. But it is. I guess it's, <laughs> it's still contentious. I don't know. Um, I, <laughs> I mean, I personally, if I have the opportunity to shoot on film, I shoot on film. Mm -hmm. If I can make that work budgetarily, uh, that's my, my preference. Yeah. I, there's so many things that are great about digital. Um, I'm not going to lie. I mean, low light sensitivity, flexibility, the cameras are smaller. I mean, not if you're shooting super eight, but obviously some of the cameras are smaller if you need them to be smaller. All there's so many things. Um, but I just think film looks better. I just think it looks better. Yeah. I, I know that's not a technical thing. It just looks better to me. I don't think, I know there's people out there that are like, ah, you can make anything look like anything. And I guess you can, um, I guess you can really make digital look like a film emulsion. You can do it. Um, does it have the same effect? I'm not sure. I mean, it's getting better and better. I'm sure in another 10 years, you just, it won't matter anymore, but I still think there's something about films, the, those punchy mids, the flesh tones, the, the color space. I mean, you're really, it's different. It looks different. I don't, I, I don't care what anyone says. It looks different. You can feel it. I, uh, I agree with you like 98%. I think it because I do I, I I'm in the camp now after a lot of kicking and screaming that you can make anything look like anything. There is something about film I, like the visual cadence of it. I don't know. There is something different, but I think it all comes down to workflow. Right. If that's what you want it to look like, just shoot film. If, yeah. Why yeah. spend the extra time and money to shoot digital, which is, you know, digital, the workflow thing being like, oh, you, you know, if you got the shot, you can review, you can whatever. Um and then spend a bunch of time trying to replicate a look that you could have just gotten if you shot film, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it is not that much more expensive anymore. I mean, the different, the differential between like having to get all the hard drives and all that stuff. I mean, storage, it's not that big of a difference. I mean, of course for a line producer it is, but. Right. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that's, that's my feeling on it. Uh, because I find myself when I shoot digitally, I oftentimes find myself searching for a LUT that emulates the contrast curve of film. And I, I, I've, that for me is really frustrating. I don't want to, I don't want to have to think about that. Like that's, that's a distraction from being creative on set. That's a distraction from shooting the story, you know, 
obviously I need as a cinematographer, I have a responsibility to understand these technical things, but for me, that's just a distraction. Totally. I don't, it's, it's not, it's not the, it's not why I'm a cinematographer, you know? And that's why I was saying earlier, I think a lot of people get lost, are lost now in the technical elements of cinematography. And there's many reasons for that. It's not, it's not cinematographer's fault. I think it's just the place we've been pushed into more recently. Everything's more acceptable or uh, accessible. Yeah. The more, yeah, for sure. Um, but, uh, so, so yeah, so I, I, for me, those types of technical considerations become really distracting and I don't, I don't want to have to think about that. They, they spent a hundred years with the greatest color scientists in history, creating contrast curves for film, not, you know, and, and that's, that's, that's their job and that's not my job, you know? There, you know, that's, uh, that brings up something I've said a few times on this podcast, which is, uh, if you want the best whatever stills camera or light setup or anything look for right before everything changed. So for instance, or, or like even art forms like style, right? Right before audio came out, the films that people were making were incredibly stylish and then audio came out and they had to make the cameras fucking enormous. So they couldn't move them around because they had to blimp them. So they couldn't move yeah. them anywhere. So all the films that came after audio were really locked off, barely moved at all. And you just watch the creativity take a nosedive. Yeah. Um, same thing with like, you know, when digital cameras came out, film cameras were getting like automatic film cameras were getting to the point where it's if you were to grab, I can't remember which Nikon, but there was this like modern Nikon that came out in like 2006, I think. And you could it interchangeably use that with the digital camera and the experience is exactly the same except you're shooting 35. Um, oh yeah. The, uh, the F5, I think. Yeah. That might be it. The F5 body where it was the first, I think, digital back as well. Oh, Nikon. really? That's a, I think that Nikon, the F5 also created the first digital back that you could swap and put a digital sensor on the camera as well. Right. And you see all that innovation and then where are we now? Like it's all the same now. It has been, yeah. 20 years. Um, I did want to ask, like, because you guys work together so much, is there kind of a uh, shorthand that you come up with? Or is there like a specific style? Because it does seem like, Wes, you, you like looking through your website, there is a, there is a cohesive style, even in, in your more um, or coherent, I should say, uh, even in your commercial work, which tends to be less, not your commercial work, but commercial work tends to be less stylized. But you can still see kind of a, an element of... Um, traditional filmmaking there, not so much corporate filmmaking. Uh, is there, is there like a kind of style that the two of you tend to aim for when you, when you guys are collaborating? Yeah. Or, or a vibe. Yeah. <laughs> the kids love vibes. <laughs> yeah. You want to take that one or. <laughs> um, I think, well, Wes and I started working together on some of my sort of weirdo performance art projects mm. and I, I think just like we're both very, <laughs> I feel like we're both very precise and like, but we're both willing to like experiment and, and learn from each other, which is really helpful. So I don't know if that's a shorthand mm. there, but um, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on the shorthand? It's like a tough question. I think West is very, West is very <laughs> patient. Um I'd say, and <laughs> no, I goes think... along with my insane ideas. That's the DP's is job. That, is that a shorthand? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is that shorthand? Um, <laughs> no, I, 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 uh, yeah, I, I. It's a tough question because yes, I think we do have a shorthand visually like i think we share common ideas when when we're working and especially on this last music video um on je voix so but i think part of but i do think what maria's yeah maria's it's accurate to say part of the shorthand is to to actually just be open to like experimenting as well we do like a, we spend a lot of time in pre-production on these on the last two music videos we did and and also her her last big theater performance piece um, and, uh, and so I think with that, we, it, 
gives us a freedom when we're on set to 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 experiment because we know what we need to get for the for the story and for the ideas and then maybe the egos aren't there yeah and we're not like scrambling to to find it on the day right so then suddenly when spontaneous things do happen we can like go for it and you and know, you know where uh, the two of you, you know where she's headed mentally, and you can just be like, "Oh, this will be good," or maybe I don't chase that down. Yeah, for sure. And you know, Maria is very, very, very detail oriented. Like she really, when she sees something, you know, uh, like a like a location that she wants to shoot, and she like she sees like where she wants, what she wants to see, mm. little details. You know, I mean, like. I would maybe set up a camera and be like, Oh, this is, this is good. And she'd be like, well, let's just push in like, like a foot. And it, and it doesn't really change it that much, but it just gets something out of the frame that she didn't want in there, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so, so like over the course, like I started to kind of see some of the things that she likes and what she doesn't like. And that, that, that's part of our shorthand, I think now as well. Totally. Now you mentioned that, uh, working on theater stuff, are you helping her with, with theater stuff as well? I have in the past. Yeah. What, what capacity did you fill there? Uh, I was like working yeah, well. Shooter. Yeah, I was shooting and it. I did some music. I <laughs> way, way back in the day. I actually, no, for the, we oh, did a yeah, show. Yeah, yeah. I directed a show at Red Cat, um, for their now festival called Lau Cohen with Kiberia at nine. Um, it follows like this Vatican Museum's tour guide who meets a Trojan soldier version of herself. Um, uh, so Wes, there was, it was sort of like a theater film hybrid. It was peak pandemic mode. So there was like, mm -hmm. there was a film in the show. And then we also had to film the show in the theater. That yeah. was then broadcasted later. Um, so Wes yeah. shot everything for that. So shot the short film in the piece and then shot the piece, edited the piece and did some, composed some music. Oh yeah, and I, did, I composed a song, which... It's greatest achievement. I'd say, it. yeah, I call that the greatest, my greatest <laughs> achievement actually. Is it, <laughs> do you not have a music background? No, I'm, I'm, I'm like, uh, I like, you know, I'm of course moonlighting as a, you know, amateur right. position in my own, in my own fantasy life. Right. Like <laughs> I was a, I was a rock star, not a cinematographer. <laughs> right. So yeah, no, I, I do play music. So yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah I, I didn't know if you were going to be like, yeah, I help. I, I would run the curtain. It was really yeah. just being supportive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I did like the, yeah, I did the mini movie or, you know, the short film inside of the theater performance. And then I, and then when we did it, I, I, I photographed the, the actual performance elements as well that then were broadcast. So. Yeah. Now, Maria, you mentioned that uh, you, you have like weird ideas and stuff. And I, and I think I, whatever you're doing, I, I like I, it's, I like the weirdness. Uh, where do you, where are those things come? You know, that's a, there's a very, there's a freedom to trust in yourself for your weirdness to be good. Um, were you always kind of confident like that or did that take a lot of work to, or, or did you always trust that kind of inner artistic voice? I think it wasn't, um, until I went to London, was doing a theater studies background. And most of our degree was reading and writing about plays. And then you also get like all the theory uh, education as well. And we had to make our own shows. So I was working with, actually I was working with, I started volunteering for a theater of the oppressed um, theater company called Cardboard Citizens in the UK um, as a, costume person so I would do that and then make I would dress like go work at opera houses at night and then in my spare time would make sort of performance art shows um and so I've sort of continued to do that doing sort of costume and then where I can make performance art work shows and that sort of recently has translated into directing stuff sort of short form stuff like music videos um but I think I think with that sort of devised theater background, 
it's enabled me to like feel confident to explore, investigate some of these questions I have and make that be the central focus and like that be enough. So if mm. I have a question or have, I think like with Lau Cohen, we were at the Vatican museums and there was this tour guide that I became obsessed with and I like fell in love with her. And she was giving us a tour and then we saw the Lau Cohen statue and sort of that sort of like looking into that and doing a lot of research there. That's sort of where the show came from. But yeah, I think giving my space, giving myself this space to ask these questions and do the research makes me feel like there's a purpose behind whatever I'm doing. Sure. Yeah. That's, you know, kind of like, uh, I guess I guess if you study really fucking hard and you and you know everything about everyone that came before, there's nothing left. There's not life isn't that interesting. And letting yourself like ask those questions, be inspired by something, and be like, all right, I'm gonna figure that out myself and see if I come to the same result is is a, a more fun way to live for sure. Yeah, I think that's like for yeah. I mean, it's just about it's about like being curious, right? About yeah. being curious about just being. <laughs> <laughs> just being, you know, you, you, we're here. And um, that's why I like working with Maria. Cause I think her, her ideas are like explorations um, of idea of concepts that she's interested in. And uh, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I think, yeah, it's cool like that. Well, it, it is a very uniquely American thing to have everything need to be, uh, either monet monetizable or productive, right? There's, we, we even, you know, sure enough in school, we hack all the art programs. That's one thing, but like, uh, we don't encourage people to just ponder, you know, we are not philosophers <laughs> for the most part. Um, and so it is fun to, uh, meet people who, who are kind of on that same thing. Cause I certainly sit at home and, and do plenty of thinking on my own, uh, <laughs> It's a, a lot, a lot of questions and yeah, yeah it could and, just be anxiety, but, um, <laughs> well, yeah, no, I think you're right about that. There's like a maximalist utilitarian element to, I, I guess maybe, maybe English speaking countries, but mm. I wouldn't, you know, but, but especially in America, that's true. It, it, it's even in the methodology of how, you know, we work on set, um, and that doesn't sometimes doesn't feel like there's a lot of room for exploration. Um, you just got to do it. And that's that. <laughs> we've, we've got one guy, we got David Lynch and he's the only one who's allowed yeah. to explore everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> everyone else you just have to produce and that's it. Yeah. it, does, it and it has to make 100% sense. Yeah. Like and make no, a billion no dollars. Room for, yeah. No room for uh, uh, interpretation. <laughs> You know, there's this great book. It's a very small book uh, written by this Japanese dude called In Defense of Shadows. And mm -hmm. he talks about all kinds of stuff, um, you know, architecture and rooms and light and d bathrooms. There's a whole chapter on bathrooms where he's like, Americans are fucking weird. They built all their bathrooms are white. Like, why? Why? Make it dark in there. That's where you're going to think. That's where gross stuff happens. Like, do why is it so bright? Why? Like, you're just going to highlight gross stuff. <laughs> Like, yeah, right. Point. Yeah. Um, that's funny. But it's a, it's a good book for cinematographers though, especially, but also just filmmakers in general just because it is it is like a meditation on not uh completely exposing something. And I don't mean that in a literal lighting sense, although I do, but like just form, you know, how light interacts with with buildings and and form and and how that changes the mental function of something I find fascinating. Did any of that make sense? Read the book. No, yeah. <laughs> no, that totally made sense. I, I mean, yeah, it's absolutely. I mean, I, I read it. Yeah, I know. I was, yeah. Well, you know, I said that was, that was, that was maybe going back to something earlier, but that's what I was going to say. I think a lot of, when you work in a field where you have to have a certain level of tech technical expertise, but you're also trying to tell a sort of ephemeral, trying to grasp some ephemeral thing called story or emotion or whatever, you know, it's so subjective, but I think you, you know, it's easy to get lost in just the very technical elements of it all. I, I just 
sometimes that that can be really soul sucking. I mean, it's exciting because you get to geek out. I mean, I'm, I mean, I love geeking out on tech stuff as well. But there's a there's that's like I try to compartmentalize that, you know, and leave right. that one part of the process. And the rest of the pro- the majority of the process needs to be the sort of theoretical elements, um, because at the end of the day, you got a great story. You put the camera in a somewhat decent position. People are going to be drawn to it. I mean, it's. I'm not saying. I'm not saying that you can be lazy or do a crappy job, but I just think that you know. I'm not saying throw out your your drive to make something look beautiful. Um, that's all. That's all in service to the story as well. But I just. I just mean that you know, if you do have a good story and you put the camera in a decent position, people. That's what people want, and all the other things are to accentuate that. You know. Yeah. The characters and the and the and the that's the lifeblood of of it all is the is the humanity of it I guess. Yeah, there's uh that and I guess that's where you become an expert, right? Because you can have all the coolest gear in the world, but being able to translate what's in your head to something that someone who's not in your head can, um, you can make them feel the way you want them to feel when you want them to feel it, as my old directing teacher said. Um, yeah that's that's where the expertise comes in because certainly you could have a really goofy cool idea and then just put it on the canvas as it were and everyone goes what is that and you're like you don't get it <laughs> like that's not that's not good uh you know artistic communication right yeah well i mean i think it's you know like when i was back in college as well like a lot of uh experimental filmmakers that would be the that would be it but you <laughs> I mean, it's funny because even in, you know, Maria was like saying, you know, when she was doing, when she was doing the music video or Lau Cohen, for instance, or, you know, she was constantly like going over, like, am I achieving what I like, what I'm thinking about? Am I achieving like what I'm, am I saying is what I'm trying to say coming through in the end, you know, like that's, that that's not that was something that she she was always coming back to and when we would talk about the music video like we were always talking about like does this location work for this music video based on what we're trying to do even if there's ambiguity or experimental elements of it that where the story isn't a, a clear plot driven story are we are we still executing everything in a way that is consistent with the original ideas you yeah. know and be adaptable as well at the same time. That actually brings up a good question, I suppose, for you, Maria, which is uh, how many people do you kind of check in with and what kind of people are they that uh, allows you to know, oh, I'm on the right path here? Because you got to sanity check anything. You can't just, no one can just trust themselves 100%. That's how you get Elon Musk. Um, But you can't. uh, But, uh, you know, like, how do you, how many people or what kind of people do you check in with to make sure that your, your art's coming through the way that you want without giving up the soul of what you were trying to do in the first place? I think, um, I'm usually collab, like I'm usually collaborating with like one, two, however many people. So like, I feel like constantly staying in communication and making sure that we're all on the same page and just bouncing ideas off of each other is really helpful. So I think, I think that's what grounds me, just the collaboration and working with other people. And I, but I think as like a director, you need to know where, at least have some idea of where you want to arrive and like, yes, collaborate with everyone and experiment, but I think you need to be able to, trust yourself and and where you want to arrive and go back. I suppose I meant uh, people outside of the creative team that you've built. Do you, do you check in with people kind of, uh, Hey, can you like, I'll do that with my girlfriend a lot. Like, Hey, can you watch this and tell me if it's dumb, you know, (laughs) cause she's not a film person. She's a dancer. So she, she'll look at it. Uh, She did get a degree in literary analysis. So smart, (laughs) smart friend to have, but uh, you know, like, Hey, does this look right Mm. to the average person? I, think on occasion i will like ask my siblings if i want them to look at some like what does this look like to you i'll usually ask 
my sister or brother who are not in this industry. And like, sometimes I'll be like, Oh, that's the bad answer. Never mind. I didn't mean to ask you. Know, sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> but usually that can be helpful. But otherwise I think like on these latest projects, I like Wes and I would just talk or for Lau Cohen, we worked with the choreographer and performer Samantha Moore when we're working with Gal Mosset, we'll stay in communication with her. But yes, I definitely think it's helpful to sometimes ask someone for an outside opinion. Yeah. Um, well, think, well, oh, go ahead. Oh yeah. No, I was going to say, I think she, I think you did reach out to your sister about, I recall, uh, was it on this music video? I thought you were, I, I think she's, yeah, she uses her sister as a sounding board quite often, actually, because she's not in the industry. For. Yeah, well, she's not in the industry, so she can, you know, look at it and go, I, I don't understand this. Or, yes, yeah, so, oh, this is really conceptually interesting. Yeah. No, well, and I guess you have, like, people outside. You're right. Somebody outside of the. You uh, Did you say you ask your girlfriend? Is that? Uh, yeah, sometimes. Not all the time, but, like, definitely with. Uh anything that's supposed to deliver a certain message, anything, cause I'm not a writer. So especially like if I'm editing something, uh, which is, you know, writing on the other side of it, um, I will be like, Hey, does this actually make sense? Cause you, you know, you'll sit here for two weeks straight, just, you know, not taking a shower or whatever, <laughs> just becoming a little edit gremlin. And yeah. then, uh, and you come, you pull your head out of the water and you're like, did I make anything? Yeah. <laughs> you go, oh no, that's good. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Does this make sense? Does this make any sense? Yeah. yeah. There's definitely Yeah, the definitely coming back, you know, maybe you uh chemically alter your mindset just ever so slightly and then go back to the edit and go like, "Wow, I really thought I was doing something here. I got to delete, 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 delete." <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, the the, the t moment of terror when you're like, "Oh my gosh, do I have to create a new timeline and start from scratch?" <laughs> Man, I I'm a big proponent of uh, every time I reopen Premiere, I duplicate the timeline. Yeah. And I just work there because like just in case something terrible happens or I have a horrible idea, at least I know I can go back to whatever the save state was at the beginning. A little tip for any yeah. of the editors listening. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I was going to say also, Maria, we we have a couple of close friends who um that we really trust their opinion. We, we did, we do, we do send out the cuts mm -hmm. to them, see what their feedback is. Cause one of them is an editor and the other one's a writer. And, um, so, so that's always helpful. Just people who also having someone who is like in the industry, but then knows story and stuff. Right. Um, and, uh, it's good to get that feedback as well. Just have some like sound. An extended collaborative circle. Yeah, <laughs> it's it sort of is, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just going up to people in Walmart like, hey, I need you to watch this. No, no, no. Come here. Come here. Come here. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think, you know, <laughs> well, I think it's funny because I, I, I know some filmmakers, they, they sort of hear like the the um, the test screening, the words test screening, and right. they automatically, it triggers in them like uh repulsion or something, you know, it's, it's like, as if that violates like the, the rules of authorship. And um I don't know if it does. I mean, look, I, obviously you're not, you know, maybe at the studio level where they're trying to just please the lowest, the perfect product. Yes. Quote, yeah, perfect, exactly. I get how how soul crushing that is, but I don't think that inherently there's anything bad because you're not making any of this stuff in a vacuum. You do want people to like enjoy it and engage with it. And sometimes you, when you are when you do become the the you know a little gremlin or troll locked in a dark room for for weeks and weeks and weeks or whatever whatever role you've played on the on the the production stage of that, you do you can lose your perspective. Um, so it's good to get outside perspective or go for and a then, walk <laughs> yeah, or go for a walk. Yeah. Leave I mean, the dungeon. That's yeah, a leave hard the one. Dungeon. <laughs> um, you know, and I, and, and part of the skill, I guess, of like, I don't know, maybe Maria feels differently, but I imagine part of the skill for director is knowing which, which comments are worth considering and which ones you just immediately throw out. Totally. Yeah. 
And that comes um, down to experience though, right? Like, you know, you can tell when someone has no fucking clue what they're talking about and you're like, all right, well, thank you for the input, but I will graciously <laughs> not listen. Yeah. Well that, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the, uh, yeah, totally. <laughs> so, well, we are, uh, we're coming up on time here, unfortunately, but, um, I, I like to end the podcast, uh, asking the same two questions, although next season they might change. Who knows? I think this might be the last episode of this season. So that's fun for us. Um, cause I leave for December, January, so I can't, I can't keep doing interviews. Um, <laughs> but, uh, the first question, and it's kind of weird for a music video, but we'll go with it. Uh, if if you're programming a double feature for this music video, so maybe you put another music video or maybe a film, what would you program with it? Julia, the other music video. Oh, all right. Fair enough. <laughs> both, of, both the music videos we did with Gal Musset, oh, back to back. God. They're both about lonely women. Oh, yeah, I guess that's true. Like uh, alter egos. Sure. Um, or an episode of Midsummer Murders. <laughs> my okay. favorite. Oh my gosh! Wow. What's your answer? Oh man, this is such a this is a tough it's one. It's gonna be really eloquent. No, I, I don't know if I have an eloquent one for this. These are the these are the these are the uh, the stumpers for me whenever I have to think up on the, on the fly. Um. Oh my gosh. Maybe I would double feature with um, Cleo from five to Agnes Sparta's Cleo from five to seven. Okay. For this. Um, or like a, a Fellini's um, uh, Juliet of the Spirits or, uh, or um, oh my gosh, why is the, the title? Uh, Knights of Kiberia. Oh, okay. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, that could be a good one. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, just the, the, because I think there is elements of these, of that music video that are related to like female identity and um, that's not strictly speaking, but there are, there are those things, you know, so. Sure. I mean, the, the fun thing about the double features, uh, you can, you can either uh, echo what the, your film or music video or whatever is, or you can contrast it. You know, the, the example I love giving is uh, Sagan. I said contrast it with Midsummer Murders. <laughs> exactly. Well, the the one that I've said a few times uh, is when I because it just because it was hilarious was I was interviewing uh, Jeff Cronin with who is someone I really look up to, and I asked him yeah. about the uh, the double feature for being the Ricardos, and he said without skipping a beat, he goes Alien versus Predator. <laughs> Amazing. I think Amazing. that's good. Yeah. The contrast, something to push against. Yeah. The well, because it can also, I mean, get a little inside baseball, but the reason I like contrasting ones is because it does highlight almost more explicitly one other artwork, you know, because because obviously if, you, if you've picked a perfect yin to that yang, it'll have everything the other one doesn't or is or is proving the point with the counterpoint, which I yeah, think is, sure. is a, which is. A yeah, cool see, my, my answers are boring. Maria's are like interesting and exciting and thought provoking <laughs> really at the end of the day. You're not going to get extra points by doing that. Um, yeah. the <laughs> I, went for the safe, I went to the safe, the safe answer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> second question, which I, this is kind of a newer one and I, and I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Uh, shout out to, to Johan Broschenschiefer, but, uh, never going to pronounce his last name correctly. Um, but, uh, or Han, Hanjo. Anyway, um, what's the worst piece of advice you ever got? Man. You can go first. Oh my gosh. Just advice about anything? Uh, but preferably about the work, but um, you know, sometimes life and, like and work advice. intermingle. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Specific. Oh, go ahead. You, you, you. I can, um, this is kind of like a bit sad, but I remember when I was first realized I wanted to be a costume designer. Someone asked me like, what do you want to do? There was the industry person. I was like, oh, I want to be a costume designer. And they told me, oh, you mean you want to be a costumer, like a set costumer? I was like, no, I want to be the designer. And like, oh, there's only, there's not a lot of costume designers. So 
you should say like you want to be a costumer and it was I didn't know any better and I kind of it was like this really sad <laughs> person in a position of power gave me it actually affected me because I just was like oh okay I guess I want to be a costumer I it's really strange so that was a really bad profoundly bad sad piece yeah. That's literally the last person I interviewed basically said that about being a cinematographer because they were working in other oh. fields, you know, trying to become a cinematographer. And the person told them, like, don't say you're trying to be a cinematographer because then no one will hire you. Like, say you're trying to be an AC or whatever they were doing uh, until you get that chance. And he was like, that was a horrible fucking idea. I should have just been saying cinematographer the whole time. Yeah, that's so, so sad. it's sad. And it's it's interesting because when I was assisting, I was I or as my first actually was my first job as a, a production assistant. I just moved out to L.A. and the first AC on that show asked me what I wanted to do. And I said, I would like to be a cinematographer. And she said, what the fuck are you doing on set in the camera department? Then she's like, do you want to be an assistant? And I said, no. I mean, I don't think so. And she said, then you shouldn't be assisting in the camera department. You need to go out and become a cinematographer because she was a career first. And I get what she was saying. I know that. Yeah. But you have you know, to know what she's saying to get, for that to work. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. Otherwise, you're going to spin your wheels for a fucking decade. <laughs> exactly. You're like, well, I need to pay the bills, but. <laughs> but yeah. I, but I, the same bad advice. I got no. Well, it was it was sort of like good, good and bad advice. But I think the worst advice I ever got was just when I, uh, I think you know, just someone told me that I could never, that it was a dream, mm. to be to want to become a filmmaker, and that was the worst advice I'd ever gotten. Was what? give up? Was give up? <laughs> Yeah, just give up. It's it's a stupid it's a stupid dream. Ironically, it is a dream, but you, it's a dream you can experience and take part of. Yeah. It's well, not, it's not. Yeah. Well, and also, it's not like I want to be a millionaire. It's like yeah. I want to do a job. People do jobs. Yeah. You know, it's a, <laughs> it's a job. You know, like you you work. I mean, it's hard work. Yeah. So. Wait, yeah. can we hear you? Yeah, what's what's yours though? Oh, um, you know what's funny is I've never thought about it, but uh, I think you know what. To be perfectly honest, I don't think I have a good answer because I never took anyone's advice. I was a very bad listener growing up, and there was a lot of advice that I should have taken and didn't. Um, so I don't know. I think I think knowing that it was bad advice means you applied it. And I was very rarely applying <laughs> what people told me to do because when I was younger, I just thought I knew better, you know, and sometimes I did. Sometimes it was good to go with my own um, instinct. You know, I've learned I've learned in, you know, now that I'm hitting my mid thirties that like my instincts tend to be pretty good, but that's after 30 plus years of educate, you know, learning life uh, experience. And I think when I was in my twenties, uh, no, you know, I, I didn't, uh, I was maybe too in my head or, or just think, you know, certain things would come easy to me. So I just thought like, Oh, I know what I'm doing. When in reality, it was just kind of like a, uh, innate skill that I sometimes had and then would apply to everything else that happened in my life. Um, <laughs> so I think the worst advice I ever got was me telling me that I'm amazing at everything. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, but you know, you get humbled throughout the years, and then you uh, recover from that. And I think, I think that did make me a better person. You know, I think everyone needs to be. I think in some ways, some people need to be humbled less than others. I certainly needed a sizable <laughs> kick in the ass, but um, yeah, that would that would be mine. <laughs> Listening to myself too early. I know, good answer. Um, well, thank you guys so much for uh, spending the hour and some change with me. That was that was a lot of fun. And, and like I said, the the work you guys have done together and, and also um, obviously I was looking more at Wes's stuff because I'm a DP. Uh, it all looks fucking great, man. Just re really, uh, really good shit. <laughs> very, very. Yeah, I'm no. proud of you. I don't know what the I don't know what the <laughs> appropriate sign off is for that, but uh, no, really I great job. That. You know, thanks, thanks for having. Yeah, us. thanks for having us. We really appreciate it. It was super, super cool to do this. Awesome. Well, uh, I uh, will we'll stay in touch, I'm sure. But uh, we'll uh, see you around the next time. 
Okay, See fantastic. You. Have a great day. Yeah, Bye. take care. Frame and Reference is an Owlbot production. It's produced and edited by me, Kenny McMillan, and distributed by Pro Video Coalition. Our theme song is written and performed by Mark Pelly, and the FNR Mapbox logo was designed by Nate Truax of Truax Branding Company. You can read or watch the podcast you've just heard by going to ProVideoCoalition.com or YouTube.com slash Owlbot, respectively. And as always, thanks for listening.